Honey, I blew up the business. Welcome to the podcast. We've got Jason Kingsley here on a hot day, hot, hot, hot summer's day in the UK. Great to see you. Yeah, it's blisteringly hot, isn't it? It's unusually hot. There, there you go. Lesson for business. Things happen you're not expecting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, exactly. First lesson of the day is imparted already. Regular listeners will know that the UK is always freezing, so uh, hot days are quite rare. But uh, I'm very excited to have Jason here because he's, uh, I'm, I'm cribbing here from his own social media, co-founder, creative director and CEO of Rebellion, and we'll get into what they do, but he's a mounted man at arms. <laughs> right? And again, we'll get into that. And a, a YouTuber on Modern History TV and the look, looker after of many horses. Yes, that's uh, that's certainly a humbling thing as well. You, you, um, when you have things in your life that you have to every day do certain things to keep them alive, it, it keeps you literally and metaphorically grounded, which I actually think is a really good thing for anybody to have, uh, especially when you're when you're sort of in charge of a large number of people or um, running a you know an international multi multinational company corporation. I, I think. Um, Having something that you've got to clear up the literal shit of uh, every day is actually is, is just good for your spirit. There you go. Often the theme of this podcast is having to pick up metaphorical shit in the world of business, but physical actual shit picking up grounds you for the, the metaphorical shit. Uh, rebellion is a is one of I mean a completely uh, independent creative pioneering uh, media business, I guess you'd call it now, originally starting in games and perhaps uh, most well-known for, for video games, founded in 1992, which I worked out was 30 years ago using maths. Yes, yeah, 30 years ago. It doesn't seem like 30 years ago. Sometimes it seems like yesterday and sometimes it seems like it's 100 years ago. So it's a, it's a weird thing when you run a business for a long time that you you you, you lose perspective in some ways. You know, people go, oh, yeah, when did you do that game? And you go, 20 years ago. Good grief. That's a long, that's a long, long time. Yeah, we, we started the business. My brother and I started the business. We just left university. Um, and we both wanted to get into a creative business. And computer games had been part of what we'd started playing around with as kids. We, we used to type in, we used to get magazines, monthly magazines, and we used to type in the computer games that were printed in those magazines. And there were always bugs in them. You always had to wait for the next month for the for the corrections. So that was a good lesson. They never worked. Then you wait for a month and you can correct them. And they were always disappointing. Uh, and we thought, hang on, we could do this. So so we really just sort of kicked off the business because we wanted to make computer games. And we kicked it off with the excitement and ignorance of people that don't really know how to run a business. Um, and I, I actually think the most difficult part of, of starting a business is starting a business. You know, lots of people down the pub will talk to you about their great idea and you think, oh, that is quite a good idea. And then you meet them next week and they haven't done anything about it and that idea sinks without a trace. And I genuinely think the hardest thing you can do is actually start that journey. Um, and the second hardest is making that journey successful. But basically, just even starting on that journey is you should congratulate yourself. You should feel good about even just having a go. Just curious, why is it so difficult? Because... Doing business on a spreadsheet or on paper and then making notes and working out how it might happen uh, is relatively easy. But when reality bites, um, when you have to make decisions that matter to your income, to other people's income, where you encounter rules that you didn't even know existed about certain aspects of your business, you know, um, when cash flow problems come along and you go, holy mackerel, how am I going to, how am I going to pay, meet payroll this month, let alone pay the rent? Those are formative aspects of running a business. They're not glamorous and people rarely talk about them. A lot of, a lot of people in the media who are journalists who aren't business people in the same way, they perceive running a business as a, a bit like a game show that we've all seen, you know, the sort of apprentice or dragon's den and you make high level decisions and I'll take that, I'll do that. No, it's literally not that. That is literally the opposite of making a business. That's a tiny aspect of every business. Businesses are about hard work, long, long hours, sometimes um, sacrifice. 
luck. Luck plays a part. And I think anybody that's successful that doesn't say luck has played a part is lying to themselves. And I think lying to yourself is actually very dangerous as well. Uh, and um, I, I just feel, I just feel that this kind of podcast that we're doing now is actually really important to help educate people about what it is really like to run a business and what you might encounter and the the glamour and lack of glamour in equal measure. So, I, I, yeah, congratulations. I think it's brilliant what you do. Well, thank you. And hopefully, actually, if you're listening to this and you think what we're doing is good, please share the podcast with your friends and give us a five-star review on Apple uh, Podcasts particularly. So but you're kind of looking back now with this sort of 30-year career, having learned all that. I want to kind of take you back to that cusp moment, because this is often there are moments that you can recall where it was the emotional decision was made. So you were that guy in the pub, right, with your brother um, and your mates maybe going, yeah, yeah, we can make video games. We can do this. And then you wake up the next day, instead of like just having a cup of tea and nursing your hangover, you actually did it. But what pushed you to do that? I mean, again, so you, all these practical things which you didn't yet know. But at that time, what was the thing that spurred you to do it? Was, what was it? What got you to do it? I would say it's two things. One, one excitement about the idea of actually having a go, running a business and trying to make it work. And also lack of knowledge. Because... In some ways, when you don't know what the problems might be that you're going to come up against, you're not that worried about them. You know, if you knew that the mountain was incredibly high that you had to climb and, and it was going to be really unpleasant at times and all that kind of thing, you probably wouldn't start. And I, so I think in some ways, not over obsessing about the problems that you're going to encounter. Don't cross those bridges before you need to cross them. Obviously, be aware perhaps that they might exist and keep an eye on cash flow and keep, you know, Fulfill your promises. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in paying things on time and doing what you say and being straightforward in business. Um, and and that, that sort of reflects a little bit my hobby, the sort of knights and knight in armor, horses and all that kind of thing. I try to follow some aspects of the rules of chivalry, not all of them, because some of them are a bit weird But for today. But um, a, a, an awful lot of them, I think, uh, are applicable. And I, and I think... You can gain a lot in business by being very honest and straightforward with people, doing what you say, and then they'll work with you again. Um, and they might even put a good word in for you to somebody else. You might not even know that. And I think that sort of positive karma goes around actually much more than people think. You, you get your media types of, of big business person that we all know about who are actually really bad at business. They're, they're media personalities, and their example is – complete outlier of how to run a good business. So we had a, a, a previous guest on this podcast called Vikas Shah, and he um, he said exactly the same thing. You have to sort of delineate between entrepreneurship and entertainment. You know, it's the two very different things. But on, on this point about um, the rules of chivalry, could you just, um, I'm going to come back to this positive karma thing, because that's happened to me within the last month. And I'm going to ask, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing little story. So just but on this point, could you explain to people who don't know about your your kind of side gig as a, uh, as a, as a knight, what, 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 what this is? By the way, the, the Washington Post, no less, said that you are the LARPer's LARPer, and LARPer being live action role player. The LARPer's LARPer, according to the Washington Post. So to explain what that is. What do you do? Well, I, um, so my, in real life, I uh, breed and train war horses. So myself, I do it all myself. Um, so I will, um, I will train a horse, I will ride, ride it, teach it to be ridden, teach it to wear armor, teach it to go forwards, backwards, sideways. Uh, horses go sideways and up as well uh, in combat. And I'm researching, I'm fascinated by researching the whole sort of medieval side of, of mounted combat in particular. So I have multiple suits of real armor. This is made of steel. It's made to fit me. Uh, it's incredibly hot to wear. It's quite difficult to wear. And riding in it is is particularly difficult. The, the suit of armor, I, I, I physically joust. I do real jousting. Um, and what you're trying to do there is you're trying to break a lance against the other person coming at you. You're not trying to kill them. You're not trying to knock them off their horse. You're trying to break the lance. But the other things can happen, not the killing thing, um, but the knocking off the horse can happen. Um, and it's a focus for me because it takes me away from the high-tech world of computer games and book publishing and comic books. And uh, we, we have production studios now. We're doing a lot of that kind of stuff, board games. And um, it allows me to 
not so much relax, but have a total change in perspective. And the great thing about it is it's a sort of low technology aspect of life. I get out into the countryside, I go and visit castles and I get to camp out in those castles under canvas. And uh, for me, it's a really important decompression tool to get away and give me perspective. I think that's another thing about business. Sometimes you're so close to the coal front, you're so so deep in that mine that you can't actually see where you're going. And I think sometimes, especially if you're in charge of business or in a senior level, you need to back up a bit and get that sort of bird's eye view. And I think a change of scenery, playing a sport, going fishing, going for a long walk, can put your mind in a slightly different thing and you can you can process things without having to worry about immediately what's in front of you. So mm-hmm. for so for me, so I'm uncovering the sequence of the past um, for real. So I, I like trying to do that. And I've done lots of film and TV work and things like that. That not uh, as a professional, I get paid for it, but it's not my career. It's just something I enjoy doing. So hence, that's why he knows about the rules of chivalry. And and, and we should, you should check out his YouTube channel. We will put a link in there, which I, I notice you have uh, now 727,000 subscribers to your uh, Modern History TV. It's really great, by the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know it's a bit it's a bit sort of strange to think we've come, how far we've come because we, we actually originally started that with an idea that we wanted to see what the YouTube could do in terms of communication to people. And I said, well, why don't I just do my hobby, knights in armor and horses and stuff like that? Because it's fairly unique. I'm a fairly unique position. There are a few other people that ride horses and do stuff, but 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 not necessarily to the sort of level I do it. And it just took off after about, uh, well, actually, after about two years or no, just over a year, it really took off. And that's another example. of Sometimes things don't take off straight away. You've got to keep plugging away at it and uh, doing your best. 100 percent funnily enough, this this podcast has been going about a year and three months and it's just the last couple of months people are just coming out of the woodwork now wanting to come on the podcast and and it's got obviously some sort of momentum which is again it's great because it makes my life easier but 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 right, so, okay so we've got these rules of chivalry which i'd like to come back to but you see so you have this sort of you've applying these rules of chivalry about kind of being a good person but let's go i want to go back to this sort of start origin story where you kind of you've launched this business and you've naively thrown yourself into it Right, and you've yet to kind of uh, again all these things unfold. And I believe you got yourself into a bit of a pickle by the this is the early nineties. By the mid nineties, your your video games company, while well, had a, a positive start, got yourself into a bit of a fix with, around the payment from some people. Yes, yeah, we, we were working with a with a company called Atari, who people who uh, of my age will know. Atari were one of the fastest growing companies on the planet. Um, they spent money like water. Uh, they had fallen on hard times, and they were in a. They were, they were based in, a, in a, an enormous office in Slough. Uh, and as those people that know Slough, it's very industrial. Um, there's a famous poem, isn't there? Come friendly bombs fall on Slough. Um, and um, yeah, so it's not the most beautiful part of the world unless you like industrial, brutalist chic. Um, and they invited us. We, we had, we, Chris and I put a demo together of a game. And, and in those days, you, you, you put a demo as a short clip of the sort of game that you want to make with some paperwork and you go and present it and they decide whether they want to commission it or not. And you go and talk to people. So we went to go and sh- show it to somebody, um, showed it to a chap called Alistair Bowden. Um, but we went into these, this, this office and this office was much bigger than their company needed. And it was consequently very empty and there were long corridors you had to walk down to get to the next room. And, <laughs> Some of the some of the listeners might remember in the seventies there was this chic thing for Hessian wallpaper, the sort of fabric wallpaper, and on corners the fabric wallpaper always kind of gets worn away, and the whole of this office was clad in dark brown Hessian wallpaper, but every single corner, and along quite a lot of the walls, the Hessian had worn down to the backing paper, so it was sort of frayed and very post-apocalyptic, actually. It was rather kind of interesting from a textual perspective, but very clearly saying it's down on its heels and we don't have any money to, to, to change the wallpaper. Anyway, we went into this vast office with one person in it. We did the presentation, and this particular chat, Alistair, said, well, this is actually really good. Uh, i better go and tell the boss. So we walked through another series of corridors, you know, across a, across a bridge, down a steps, up steps into another, you know, literally an empty 
an empty environment to see the boss and the boss saw the presentation and went oh fantastic uh we would well yeah this will be really good for our new computer and the chap we were with went what new computer and the boss said oh nobody knows about it apart from me We've, i've just been told there's this new computer called the atari jaguar and this is the first that anybody in the uk had heard outside the boss of this presentation so there's chris and chris and me sitting there feeling really that we shouldn't be in this conversation between these two grown-ups having this business conversation at a big, a big company called Atari, trying to sit quietly and wonder what. Anyway, they commissioned us to do a project. So we hired a, we, we found a small office to start with, got secondhand uh, desks and computers and everything. It was all agreed. And they then said, oh, um, that budget we told you about, we went, yeah, the one that's agreed in the contract and signed and that we're now spending yeah we've decided it needs to be half that we went well we've we've already so we did so we had so Chris and i sat down and went how are we going to do this um because literally they're we have a signed contract but they're now saying we're going to pay you half theoretically they're in breach of contract but we have no money we're not going to take them to court and if we do, it's going to take two years and we're going to be busted anyway. We don't want to start our careers like this. Um, what what do we do? And we just have to, I guess, say yes and try and make it work, which is what we did. We said, yes, okay, you could pay us half the amount of money because half was better than nothing. Uh, and we somehow squeezed it, you know, managed to get it, get it, get it done in the time. Um uh, and that was Aliens versus Predator, which was uh, the big success on the Atari Jaguar. Um, it was the number one hit uh, worldwide and sold incredibly well. So that really made our careers. But there was that moment where we looked at each other and we thought we literally had the uh, rug pulled from under us. Uh, and we had a signed contract. And they've just, because they had all the power, they could change, they could change the, the rules, even though it was signed. I mean, technically, they couldn't, but what are you going to do, you know? So you see, they, they sort of literally landed this thing on your desk saying, right, well, suck it up, mate. Yeah. What happened in that, that period of time? How did you get that out of the door? Well, Chris and I didn't pay ourselves. We, we were the ones that we, we couldn't not pay uh, the five members of staff that we'd recruited, um, uh, and we couldn't not pay the office space. Um, so, yeah, so Chris and I just didn't take a – salary of any description at all um and luckily we both had a shared house we had a little bit of savings and stuff and we we basically invested in our own project with our own money you know um you know, we 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 worked out ways of you know we we slightly scaled down the production as well so we didn't we didn't do some things we wanted to so we saved a bit of money in production but um you know we we just decided it was worth doing that way you know that could have been rebellion might not be here as a result if we just said sod it we're not doing it then and just let everybody go you know not paid the uh, you, know, you know got rid of the office and dissolved the company said we're not doing it so that was uh that was a really unpleasant early lesson um and it was it was a weird thing because we thought we had a really good relationship with them as well it was a fairly positive business relationship but uh, i believe subsequently it was a decision from much higher than the people that we were working with and they were horribly subsequently we got to know them friends and they were horribly embarrassed by having to do this to these two young lads that were very talented as they saw it um but that's what they've been told to do and that was their job so um yeah it's often the case, I think, with I think big companies, they get all those diktats get sent down about cutting budgets. And if you're at the end of the food chain, two young lads with talent, you're the one picking up the tab. So, so, so you, almost there was this crossroads moment then where it was literally was, well, we either forge ahead or close this thing. All right. How long was this uh, into the, the start of Rebellion? Oh, well, we'd, we'd already started the limited company and we'd, we'd you know, got everything going. And by the time the first payment was going to come in, was, which would have taken a month. So probably a month, maybe six to eight weeks in from, wow. from getting the green light. So. so you really is like the kind of early in the cot. Yeah. The baby has been born and it's about to get squished. Yeah. Unless you kind of take this, this decision. And what do you think, and looking back now, and again, at the time, I'm sure this happened very quickly and it's probably quite intuitive, but you're looking back at that now. What do you think it was that really got you to make that 
choice? I think the excitement of running a business, actually. I think I think the, the choice was, do we run this business or do we not? And then if the choice was, yes, we run this business, how on earth are we going to run it with the money that we've got? Because there's literally no point worrying about not running the business with no money. Um, uh, uh, what, what can we do? What can we cut? What, what's, what do we have power over in terms of not spending? And the only thing that Chris and I were capable of not spending on was us, was us too. Um, and I think that's something uh, that's often at the heart of startup businesses, uh, especially those that do it organically. You know, we've never had any significant investors or, or venture capital behind us because that's a very different plan then. That's spend, as, spend this money as fast as you can and grow as fast as you can because we want to sell our shares to somebody else for a, for a profit. We've we still own 50-50. You know, Chris and I still own half the company each, in spite of having many, many options and many, many inquiries over the years about mergers and team-ups and buyouts and all that kind of stuff, as you can imagine. Yeah, we've got a huge depth of intellectual property. Lots of people find that incredibly valuable, and it is. That is absolutely valuable. But we've always been... We've always run a bit shy of it, partly, I think, because... Neither of us see money as the only motivating force behind running a business. In fact, it's probably not in the top three. I mean, obviously, it sounds absurd to say it, but you need money to run a business. You need to run it profitably. And it is a business, after all. You know, that's the whole point of it. But um, doing a deal because it's going to make us more money than a better deal that's going to make us less money, we do the more exciting and better deal with a smaller margin because it it's more motivating so we, we're not we're not some thoroughly mercenary I, some people run their business and the aim is to make as much money as quickly as possible and that's perfectly legitimate that's one way of doing it other people as you know some people run cottage industries and their point is they love doing their paid for hobby and it'll never really make them much money it might as well kind of wash its face it might make a little bit of money but it makes them happy and they're professional and they enjoy doing that. And then there's somewhere in between, which is sort of what, what we do. We love making games and publishing books and, and getting involved in that process. We've got just under 500 full-time members of staff now um, in several different parts of the, of the country. And um, I still get excited about kicking off a new project and getting it going in the right direction and wondering how it'll be received in three years' time, because it takes three years couple of hundred people, three years, make a big computer game these days. And so you're always thinking about what's going to happen in the future. I mean, we've just launched Sniper Elite 5, which was probably about five years of development, actually, with a small team to start with. Um, and I can remember three years ago wondering how well it would be received, and it was received fantastically well. It was a global number one hit, which is great. Um, and then you get the positive feedback from an audience that loves what you're doing as well, and that's a big lift as well. And um, yeah, the, the whole process is a lot of lag in the creative industries. I mean, doing a podcast, I don't know how quickly your podcasts come out, but there's always a lag. You know, you do, we're doing this podcast today, but it's not going to be shown today or listened to today. It's going to be listened to in, at some point in the future. And so you're doing exactly what we do with games, but we, with games, there's an even bigger scale. Um, you know, you're literally talking three to, three to four to five years away. Yes, it's quite a cycle you've got there. And it's, it's quite interesting in there. So you, you, there's a pattern here, actually, where you've got this back in the 90s, in month one of your nascent business, which became, you had five people you had to keep on by not paying yourself because you wanted to get it away. Yep. I'm assuming that's kind of the gist of it. But yep, I, 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 when I started my first company up, which was, um, in fact, funnily enough, we did, we did a little, I set up a brand design business and, and we did, um, we helped BAFTA launch the Video Games Awards know, back right. in uh, really naughty. So we were the brand partner for that, just for what it's worth. And the point being, we did it um, because we wanted to do something that we were proud of. Yeah. And the money thing was a kind of byproduct of that. And I think there's a certain kind of essence of some certain entrepreneurs where that's really the thing. And that's kind of what you're describing. And, and what you did back in the 90s with Atari was invest in yourself because you believed, I guess, that you could get it away, that creative 
thing. Yes. And then, it, so this, this is, I guess the scale of that's gone from five people to 500 people 30 years ago. Yes, absolutely. But also what you've got is you've got more resources. So now we've obviously got a, a bank account that money comes in, money goes out, you know, and, and there's, there's, there's a reserve, we've got a war chest. And so if somebody was to, not that we work, not that we do work for hire in the same way now, but if we were in a position where somebody says, actually, we're going to halve the budget, we'd say, no, 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 we've got a signed deal. And if necessary, we get, you know, we, we get people in wigs to have an argument in a, in a fancy room with, with wood paneling and decide. Um, and uh, so we wouldn't have the Hobson's choice that we had really back in the very earliest days because we, we had nothing, we, arguably, we had nothing to lose either because we hadn't really built anything up. But we had a lot we felt to gain from taking the pain and going through the process. We felt the game was really potentially very good. And we we knew we needed our first game out there. And the trouble is people with a different moral sense or a different perspective can see that and then exploit it. And you could argue that's what happened. You could argue it's just nothing to do with that at all. It's just business. Um I think it's probably a combination of both. What did you learn from that, do you think, looking back? Try and keep a bit of a war chest. <laughs> you know, try, not to, try not to bet everything <laughs> at once. You know, uh, uh, I've always wanted, I've always felt life should be approached uh, on a portfolio basis. You know, have, try and have multiple things you're doing at once. Don't, don't, just don't, don't go into the casino of life and bet everything on red, you know, because... You might win, but you might not. Um, you know, have have multiple bets, or, or don't even go gambling in the first place because gambling is a losing proposition. But you know, uh, what I mean is, you know, have a, have a certain level of try to have a certain level of resilience in your business. Sort of expect the worst as well. Sometimes, you know, plan plan for the best, but don't expect the best. Say if this goes well, this will be a fantastic outcome. If it goes medium, which most things do, let's say. Uh, how will how will we fear? You know, it, it, will it will it be okay? Uh, and if it goes really badly, what's the outcome there? Because the upside will kind of take care of itself, and you'll be thinking, "Well, oh, this is brilliant. We got you know huge success, lots of money, and everything's fine." If the middle and lower part of those outcomes don't aren't catastrophic, you can run a good steady business. I mean, there are there are plenty of games companies that have had one massive hit in their career made made a ton of money on it done incredibly well and failed to reproduce that success and slowly shrunk to a point where they're still you know moderately large companies but not really nearly to the same level and um i sometimes liken that to doing business like that hundred mythical hundred foot wave that that People talk about in the middle of the ocean, you know, blue water sailors talk about suddenly there's this enormous wave and it comes out of nowhere. And it's nobody's fault. It's just that all the little wavelets superimpose on each other and go to make an enormous great big wave or enormous great crop, actually. And I think this is where some of the old tales of uh, sea monsters actually come from, these sort of 100-foot waves that come out of the blue. Life and business is a bit like that. You know, you do your best to survive those situations, but they sometimes will happen. I mean, for goodness sake, who would have imagined we'd have a global pandemic where everybody had to work from home for a long time? I mean, that's not something you can plan for. But what you can plan for is having a certain amount of resilience in your business for stuff that's going to happen. I remember once I was putting a plan together for a project and the the other side said, well, you've got this 20% contingency in the budget. You know, what's that for? And I said, well, that's contingency and you know, it's for stuff. And I said, yeah, but we, we want to know what the contingency is. And we went, no, it's for stuff. That that's what, you know, literally we don't know what it is, but we know there's a good chance in our experience the stuff will happen. Oh, I think you should plan better than that. So, well, how is one supposed to plan? So they will they wanted contingency broken down into actual things. And I said, no, it wouldn't be contingency then, would it? That's li literally what the word means. It's that uh, we don't know what's going to happen, but we're having a little bit of a buffer here for shit that will happen. Um, yeah, they were very upset about it, remember? And I, and I can't quite work it out because I think it was a control thing. They wanted to know. It's almost like asking somebody, how many bugs are you going to have in that computer game? Uh, and he's like, oh, hopefully as few as possible. But it's, 
But, but yeah, you, you know it's going to happen. It's just a case of handling it elegantly when it does. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think that that portfolio approach gives you multiple rolls of the dice, if you like, or multiple opportunities to do it. Um, and and I, I I'd encourage people to try and approach business that way. But some people go for the shit or bust methodology. You know, they go for the big gamble, and then the problem with that becomes the success is. Um, it's survivor bias comes in. The media goes, oh, this person who risked everything is now a multi-billionaire. And everybody goes, oh, brilliant, I'm going to risk everything and I'm going to become a multi-billionaire. And you go, no, 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 because that one person is a banishingly small percentage of the many hundreds of thousands of people that have tried it and failed. And survivor bias is one of those cognitive biases that we, we, we talked about. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting here. There's a couple of threads here. But so could you just give us an example where, look, you know, looking back, your portfolio approach has, has kind of, you know, helped save your bacon? Well, working with more than one supplier. So when we were doing work for hire, which was in the, uh, you know, the 90s, um, we would try to have at least three clients working for us, at any, working with us, paying us to do projects at any one time, preferably at different stages of the project as well, because there's a different risk profile. So if you're very early on in a project, everybody's terribly excited, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of money to be spent. And when you're at the end of a project, people are sometimes excited or sometimes they're a bit sort of jaded and tired because they've seen this project now for two years and you, you've got to, you know, there are different risks there. So what we wanted is if one of them decided to cancel a project, let's say, and usually back in those days and work for hire projects, there's the ability for a client to uh, cancel a project without, without cause. They can just say, we don't want to go anymore. There's a, usually a sort of a certain amounts of money payable. It might be the next milestone. And usually the monthly payments roughly. So if they want to cancel, they can do it and they pay you the next milestone, for example, or the next two milestones, just to give you a bit of runway to find the next project. Typically that's how the industry works. Um, so you're never quite sure what their own internal situation is. They, you know, you think they might be really financially robust, but you don't actually know. <laughs> And they might not be financially robust at all. You're relying on them paying you and you're doing your work to the best of your ability and delivering everything you say. But that may not matter to them because they may not be able to pay you because they've run out of money. You know, that happens. You know, just because somebody's paying you and agreed to doesn't mean they've actually got the money. And as we know, yes, theoretically, you could take them to court to sue them for the money and if they stay alive, you know, but that process is going to take many many months at, at least and you've got your cash flow to think about in that time and if you take somebody to court it takes up a lot of time and energy and generally speaking you kind of even if you win if you actually work it out you're probably just about broken even because of the time and effort yeah and it's the opportunity cost of your attention i guess being doing something negative rather than positive. It's actually interesting here about that you talked about a theme has been through our conversation on the other people and call it their their financial situation, their values, their corporate structure, their intentions. And you're, you, we never really know, again, is it, what's going to happen down the line, be it a pandemic or be it a corporate restructure and a new head of you know, commissioning or what have you. Um, which comes back to this idea of the rules of chivalry. <laughs> which I think is because if we talk about values and how people treat you as an up and coming business or a startup business, what are the rules of chivalry? Right. Well, there, first of all, there's no formal set of rules. There are, they've been written down by various people in different ways throughout history. The Victorians were particularly keen on them. Um, uh, they really are a very nebulous concept that basically they come from a time when it was blokes, largely gangs of blokes with weapons could pillage the countryside and do a lot of harm to a lot of people. Uh, and society, the societies at the time developed this idea that there should be some rules of behavior. Now, these rules of behavior were, my guess is, widely flaunted as well, but at least there were some. You know, you're supposed to, for example, there's one fascinating one, which is the you're not supposed to uh, pillage church uh, church grounds. No, they, the, the church got in there quite early with this and said, look, <laughs> one of the rules of chivalry is you're not allowed to raid churches, all right? Uh, 
And everybody went, yeah, okay, yeah, that kind of makes sense. And the church went, phew, okay, good, right, there's one thing out of the way. Um, and, and then it was sort of uh, you know, fight with honour. Uh, it was d- don't tell a lie. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, no, you shouldn't tell untruths, not necessarily you shouldn't lie, but don't tell untruths. Um, you should obey, uh, obey the Lord, your master. There was a whole thing about gods, God, uh, in various different ways, in different forms, usually honoring God and honoring the church. But again, typically put in by the church sort of as a, as a way to give them a special status. Um, you're not supposed to, uh, attack women and children, you know, um, you're supposed to treat, you're supposed to treat rivals fairly. Uh, it's about being actually, it's about being a decent human being, albeit a warrior. So you, you, you should fight to the best of your ability, but you should also fight not exactly fairly, but you should, you shouldn't overtly try to cheat people in, in, in lots of different ways. So, um, yeah, it, when people when people focus on it, you go, "What are them?" Well, yeah, there's about fifteen or twenty of them, depending on whose work you're reading. And how has that influenced you in business? Well, first of all, I think honesty is really important, and I don't mean telling everybody everything, but I mean if you like something, telling people you like it, and if you don't like something, telling people you don't like it. And if somebody uh, needs uh, paying, you know, if you say you're going to pay somebody within 30 days, pay them within 30 days. And if you can, if it makes sense and you think oh, it might be a bit squeezed, pay them earlier. I'm a huge, I'm a huge believer in flow of money. You know, the velocity of money is a really important concept and that, uh, you know, the more quickly I can pay people that work for me, the more quickly, theoretically, they can pay people that work for them and the more the money can flow and everybody, you know, doesn't have all that wasted effort trying to collect debts, which is just, which is just a pain in the ass, quite frankly, and shouldn't be there. So things like that. But also, you know, when we're doing when we're doing our games, we try as hard as we can to make the games as good as they can be. Um, and um, the 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 things like being honest to yourself as well, assessing what you can do well, and finding help where you need support. I think that's another important part of growing your business is make sure your infrastructure grows with the scale of work you've got as well. You you do need support staff who are good at doing their job and they can make your job easier as, as a leader. And um, I think that's hugely important. Um, but don't let the support department take over because you see a lot of big companies where it, it feels like HR <laughs> rules the roost. And they shouldn't really. They're obviously important. All departments are important. IT is important. They're, you know, in, in our sector, we have quality assurance. We have games, professional games players. They're hugely important. Um, but everybody should have a role to play within the organization. And nobody should really be, apart from the boss, should be in charge. Nobody should lord it over anybody, everybody else. So creating the right structure and the right level of communication is really important. Yeah, that's great. It's, it's all these 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 principles, in effect, the 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 the, the rules the rules of chivalry. The, you know, paying people when you say you're going to pay them, and, and telling the truth, whether it's positive or, or negative, to the person's feelings, perhaps just sort of getting it out there. So these are all kind of uh, principles, and you say that this, this can add up to a form of positive karma. And you know, these things come back at you. Can you give us an example of where you've you, you've seen your kind of way of conducting yourself come back in a positive way in the future? Well, well, very much so. I mean, the, the the sort of hidden network of communications that you um, that is really hard to quantify. You know, when when you do somebody a favour, maybe you pay them on time, or you pay them a bit early, or maybe somebody phones you and says, "Look, I'm a bit squeezed. Is there any chance you could pay that invoice? You know, a couple of weeks early?" And go, "Yeah, sure, if you can. Okay, no skin off my nose. Um, fine, yeah, I'll get it paid." And then. Then you hear um, a year later that they were having dinner with somebody and they put in a word and they said, oh, yeah, I, I worked with the Rebellion. They were, they were really good. I had a bit of a squeeze on for cash flow and, uh, and they, they just happily paid me early and it was great. And, uh, yeah, they're good guys to work with. And that other person then tells somebody else and it comes back to somebody who wants to work with you, you know, in a big scale. It's like, oh, I've heard good things about you guys. And, uh, and, and that helps position you for the next deal and what it means is that people see you as a fair dealer it doesn't mean you're a softy it doesn't mean you kind of aren't going to negotiate hard or anything like that but um what it means is you're seen as a fair dealer and 
hopefully those decent people will deal with you in the same way. It doesn't always work that way, obviously, in business. Some people want to try and exploit you. But um, yeah, but I think broadly speaking, most people prefer doing business well right? and, 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 and fairly. Because most people want to sleep at night and most people want to feel that they contributed to society in a good way. This is where I get quite annoyed at sort of celebrity business types uh, that we that we hear about um, who are they fail horribly, repeatedly. And, you know, so so and so nobody can nobody will work with this big personality more than once because they're always screwed over. No, they never pay. They often get into fights and everything. And what that big personality forgets or doesn't think about is that there are, there's a silent, there's this quiet network of people going, just don't, don't work with them. Or if you do work with them, make sure you get paid up front. Or if you do work with them, charge them twice. Just, just put your prices up because it's a pain in the ass getting money out of them. So get your money up front, which for the big media personality actually costs them much more in the end than just doing good business would have done in the future. Yeah, it's really, I think these principles are really kind of key. And it's funny, I mentioned earlier in passing, but we had a, a so 15 years ago, in fact, my business I mentioned was working with a, a with, with BAFTA actually, with and, and one of the members of their team got in touch with me a month ago and said, like, you guys have always, I really like the work you were doing. I've kept tabs on what you're up to. And I think you could be really appropriate for what we're doing in the new role that we're in. And we've just started um, this week, we're going to start working with them. And people do remember. I mean, not, not everybody remembers. And, you know, not every time you do a favor for somebody is it going to be reciprocated. But I think more often than not, you'd be quite surprised that little kindnesses people remember. And, um, and they remember working with you and say, yeah, that was really good fun. And sometimes I've had an opportunity, you know, there'll be, there might be two opportunities and, and both are equally lucrative and both are equally interesting, but there's a personality on one of those projects who I'm really keen to work with and I got on well with or have a, they have a great reputation and they, they communicate well and they, they, they feel like they're a good person, a fun person to work with. And on the other side is somebody who's got a reputation as a bit of a twat, basically. And you think, you know what? That's going to make me choose the, 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 the working with a nice person because life's sometimes, sometimes you have to work with idiots. I understand that. You know, you've got to, you've just got to work around them or you've got to work with them. You've got to make it work. That's just business. But I kind of, I want to, if I possibly can, to work with as few difficult people as possible and as many nice people as possible. Um, because Life's too short and everything's much easier when you can have a sensible conversation with somebody if the, if the problems come up, which they always do. Yeah, no, 100%. I think there's a, there's a quality of life choice here uh, between, uh, and you said it, you don't want to work with twats, basically, is the, yeah. the episode title of this, this uh, week's edition, of, which will be Don't Work With Twats. Uh, oh, in fact, that's going to be on your T-shirt in our forthcoming merch store, <laughs> which we haven't made yet. But yeah, Don't Work With Twats. Jason Kingsley. Uh, yeah. We're heading towards the end of the podcast time together. I'm really, I mean, it's been a great conversation. I've got like, a whole load of really good stuff out of this. A question I like to ask people, we, we're dispelling lots of advice here, and there's lots of advice for entrepreneurs out there. What advice should an entrepreneur ignore? You should ignore worrying about the metagame of your business. Ignore raising money until you're in a position to actually raise the money properly. Too many... In, in my opinion, too many people forget the business and focus on the business of the business. Yeah, they're focusing on raising money, getting uh, getting venture capitalists in, talking to the bank, and all that kind of stuff. Those people are useful at certain stages of your business and in certain ways. Don't have them as the main focus, in my opinion. I I, I think you should focus on stuff the business does uh, first and get that right. People think of that as naive, and there's some massive companies that obviously focus in, almost entirely on the sizzle and raising money from investors and things like that, and somebody else takes care of the actual business. But I'm a great believer in the solid foundation of a, of, of a business that actually does something and adds value. Um, so I, I would say ignore those more aggressive MBA-style dreams of multi-billion dollar flotations to begin with. Keep them in the back of your head. But ignore them to begin with and focus on building a business in the right way and then think about the, 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 that, that upside. 
Well, I think that's great, great advice there. And I think it's um, and, and very true. And I think if you do something of value and people buy it from you, uh, money comes in. And it's a radical concept um, that you've invented there. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, there was one more thing that I was going to mention, which is don't gamble everything in one go. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just be careful. Sometimes you just can't take the gamble. It's just not worth it. You just let an opportunity go because it's just too big, too difficult at this stage. And chalk it up to experience. Don't grab every opportunity regardless of the scale because it, at certain stages of business, some things are just not manageable sensibly for you and give you a headache down the line. Uh, again, great. Very wise advice. I've made that mistake in the past. Sort of got me leg into things you can't actually handle. It looks good on the face of it. Um, well, listen, where, where can we find out more about you? And, and uh, if we're interested to learn more about the medieval knights and video games and comic books and publishing <laughs> and all that. Well, uh, obviously, the company is Rebellion. There's all the Rebellion websites, rebellion.com. There's lots of stuff there. Um, the strangely named medieval YouTube series is called Modern History TV, if anybody wants to go there. Uh, I'm Rebellion Jason on uh, at Twitter, if anybody wants to follow me there. That's a very weird mixture of photographs of horses, me in armor, and comments about the games industry. So it's a very bizarre, quite personal feed of thoughts um in that way uh i think that's about it really um yeah yeah uh, more than welcome i I try and answer quite a lot of the comments as well on the youtube channel where i can um but i almost keep the two areas a bit separate i get quite a few people going omg i've just realized you run that big company called rebellion Uh, and it's quite fun to suddenly shock people into the realization that the long-haired bloke pretending to be a knight in armor on a horse is actually a CEO of quite a big company. Amazing. That is brilliant. I, I would highly recommend this YouTube channel. The, the content I didn't know I needed to see today was you hitting a, a car windscreen with a broad with a broadsword. <laughs> yes. No, it was very good fun. And, uh, Thank but, you. But it, was, it was really fascinating and fun and interesting. And, and obviously, you've got a great talent for that. So, so, so thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for sharing so so openly. And uh, and I'm very thrilled, actually, because I, I was a big purchaser of 2000 AD back in the 80s. And I, in fact, my mum told me when I was, said I was interviewing you that they're all still in her loft. Can I come and get them? <laughs> well, you're lucky they're still there because many mums have thrown them out. It's a regular, regular story there. The whole 2000 AD thing is maybe something for another podcast, the, maybe, the, comic, yeah. the comics industry. But uh, yeah, for, for a lot of people, their whole collection is sort of thrown out when they went to uni or whatever. Um, uh, they're probably worth quite a bit now. Uh, you know, you, you might be surprised. There we go. Right, that, as soon as I put this Zoom call down, I'm off to my mum's for my, <laughs> uh, my inheritance. Get that. <laughs> all right, well, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. I'll see you all next time. Thank you. Do you want to get the top five tidbits from each episode emailed to your inbox every Friday? Yes, you do. It saves you having to go through and make notes and make a note of all the books and all the ideas that are in the podcast. We go through, we choose the top five we like, plus put all the links into that email. So if you just go up to honeyibluupthebusiness.com, Yes, that's honey, I blew up the business.com. And just enter your email address. There's a little box, just enter it in, and we will send you that information. And it saves you having to make notes and all that. That's uh, make your life a bit easier. And of course, if you did enjoy the episode, please consider subscribing. We are trying to help people through this. So the more people that subscribe, review, rate on Apple, Google, Podcasts, Spotify, the more people will see it and the more we can help. So help us help other people, other entrepreneurs like you. And before I go, I've got to say big up to my company, the tech department, the company we blew up and put back together again. They're generously supporting me on this mission through the podcast. So if you guys want to have a look at a company that can really help you improve your technology, make it better so your business gets better to boosting your sales and your profit and a bit more sanity in your life, a little less stress, then head up to the techdept.com, the tech department. Uh, My company... Uh, Give us a look. On behalf of all of us here, thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.